Welcome to another episode of the Middle East News Hour. This week, uh, senior uh, Biden administration official Barbara Liff is uh, coming to Israel and the Palestinian Authority uh, to restart a uh, talk or whatever about Israel and the Palestinians. And um, you know, there are very significant implications both to the timing and uh, of this visit and uh, to uh, for Israel itself, for its uh, national security. Uh, what we're seeing now is a reinstatement of American pressure on Israel, if it ever relented, to make concessions to the PLO, to the Palestinian Authority uh, in Judea and Samaria, and arguably as well to the Hamas terrorist authority in Gaza. And uh, I could think of nobody better this week to talk about the situation on the ground in Judea and Samaria and uh, the implications of the Biden administration's policy, as well as of the Israeli caretaker government's positions on Judea and Samaria, then with my uh, old friend and colleague, uh, uh, Major General Gershon Akoin. Uh, Gershon Akoin served in a number of different uh, uh, command positions in the IDF during his long and storied career. Uh, he was uh, uh, mainly a commander in the tanks uh, corps in, in, in the army, completing uh, his uh, command posts as the commander of, uh, of Division 36, which is responsible for uh, Northern Israel, the Golan Heights. Um, but uh, Gershon, more than anything else, is an intellectual. He is a philosopher, really, of, uh, of all things, and uh, one of the most uh, important military uh, strategists that Israel has seen uh, in decades. So um, without further ado, uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much, Gershon, for joining me on the uh, Middle East News Hour this week. It's a pleasure to finally have you on the show. Okay, thank you very much. And then just try to describe what's really going in the field in north of Samaria, mainly in Jenin City. And actually, well, before what you do that, before you give an overall description, which is what I wanted to ask you to do, but you know, can you speak for a second, uh, if you can, to how you view the timing of Lyft's uh, 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 arrival in Israel? When, uh, yeah, I where, think that after the height of, I, no, after oh, my okay, description, you start with the overall, uh, and then it will be the outcome. Uh, because, okay, great. Uh, what I'm really challenging is the main uh, premises upon them was established Oslo Agreement, and all of them are just collapsing one after the other. And if the Americans are still coming to uh, make a kind of resurrection for this stupid process that already everyone uh, without uh, uh, ignoring it must admit that it is not at all fitting to what's going on. So what on earth they are coming to do? This is the main question. Right. So we are coming to describe what's going on. Actually, the Palestinian Authority forces, those who have been trained and equipped by the Americans, General Dayton, are not at all succeeding to control the main cities, of course, not the refugee camps near Nablus, near Jenin, like refugee camp Balata, etc. In the field, we are facing organization of equipped groups that working together uh, without uh, differences between orientation. It means that we can find cooperation between Al-Aqsa battalions belonging to Fatah under the direct command of Abu Mazen, because Abu Mazen is still the high commander of Fatah, and Jihad Palestini, Jihad Islamic The Palestinian Jihad. Yes and other groups like Tanzim, Hamas, all of them are equipped, all of them are working together, uh, not only in order to manage and to create, to lead uh, terrorist operations against Israeli cities, but also to organize a kind of manifestation of power the, in the way they are acting in the streets, in the fields. Actually, they are creating a, zone, a different zone, an autonomous zone beyond the authority of uh, Abu Mazen. 
if Israeli forces would not really come to act every night against them, we could find a kind of organization, military organization, exactly similar to what's going on in Gaza Strip. Actually, the Israeli forces acting there are not acting in order just to control the area. They are doing that according to very specific and definite information, intelligence information about terrorist activities that could act against Israeli citizens in Tel Aviv, Nebak, as it happened half a year ago. And in the last half year, we are really facing a movement of operations with elite forces every night in these uh, territories, and they are all dedicated to save Israeli civilians' lives, not in order to make an occupation or something like that. They are coming, it is a strike, arresting those who are preparing terrorist activities and going back. And according to all that, we must bring to focus several basic premises that have been the basic premises for Oslo agreement. And all of them are challenged by the way in which the emerging, the emerging reality just uh, creating new strategic trend. The first premise is that separation is good for the Israeli security. As in everyone in the left wing in Israel speaking like El Barak that always repeated the slogans, they are here and we are uh, there, or exactly the opposite. They are there and we are here with the border. You're this saying is, separation between Israel and, Israel uh, and, and the And uh, a lot of others like Gadi Eisenkot, Benny Gantz, Yair uh, uh, Golan, just emphasizing again and again, repeating this stupid idea that separation will be the solution. Why it is a, an unconnected, unconnected idea, because already the separation has been made by Yitzhak Rabin that really led the separation in Gaza. In May 1994, all troops, Israeli troops, left and the civilian centers in Gaza in May, June uh, 1994, they have been removed to be controlled under the Palestinian Authority after something was else happened, Hamas. But in Judea and Samaria, all cities in Zone A and all villages in Zone B have been removed to Palestinian Authority in January 1996. It means that let me just let me just interrupt you for one second, Gershon, to just uh, people who aren't aware. So the Oslo okay. process, the Oslo peace process that began on September 13th, 1993, uh, uh, made uh, called for the gradual withdrawal of Israeli forces from population centers in Judea and exactly. Samaria and the Gaza Strip. And the first step towards that was the creation of a Palestinian authority, a, an autonomous Palestinian authority, a, cover, a Palestinian governing authority first in the Gaza Strip and the city of Jericho in, uh, in Judea uh, in 1994, in May and June. And then after Israel and the Palestinians signed a second agreement, the interim agreement, otherwise known as Oslo B, in September of 1995, at the end of 1995, the beginning of 1996, Israel redeployed IDF forces out of all the Palestinian cities and major villages in what are called area A, the cities and villages, area B of Judea and Samaria. So that the Palestinians have been operating autonomously, governing themselves autonomously since 1996 in both the Gaza Strip and in Judea and Samaria. So that's a separation, a separation of governing authority uh, between the Palestinians and Israel. Israel has not governed the Palestinians in any meaningful way since 1996. Definitely clear and accurate. It means that actually what it is called the occupation was coming to end in January 1996. Since that time, more than 90% of Palestinians are not anymore governed by Israeli government. They are under direct control 
of Palestinian Authority. And after uh, 2007, in Gaza, they are under Hamas, de facto a state, and in Judea and Samaria, under direct governance of Palestinian Authority. What and what you're mean? saying, wait, and just to interrupt you one more time, and what you've been saying since the beginning of your remarks is that essentially in Samaria, particularly, but not only, the Palestinian Authority has not been exercising effective governing authority from a, from a security perspective or exactly. otherwise. Exactly, this is the following, the following step to describe. Actually, in 2005, another step was acted, you participated with me in that occasion, that Israeli authority right. yes. uprooted four Israeli settlements surrounding Jenin. And it means that an absolute separation had been achieved in Jenin arena. So if separation is good for security, we must find in Jenin a kind of a new start of paradise because separation must bring peace. As a right. Martin Inning was always repeating good fences making good neighbors. It is true regarding John and Smith in Texas going to the same church on Sunday that good fences making with him, between them good neighborhood, not here. What happened in Gaza is the fact that they transformed themselves to be a strategic threat to Israel due to the separation and due to the high fences. Exactly the opposite. It means that the first premise is absolutely wrong. It collapsed according to what's going on in reality. What's going on just last night, we observe in TV how groups, equipped groups, making ammunition, life ammunition exercises in the field of Jenin. They are making by that observable manifestation of uh, their authority, their presence, their existence. It means they are there uh, as creating a new zone beyond the Palestinian Authority. And if Israeli forces would not act there every night, we can find a new Gaza Strip in several kilometers from Jenin Haifa, from uh, Afula Haifa Tel Aviv. It means that the first premise is wrong. The second premise was that, and Israel Rabin emphasized that again and again, that due to the fact that we are making a kind of experimentation, strategic experimentation, it is absolutely in the Israeli borders between the Jordan and the sea, so we can control it and basically he and conceived it as irre uh, not irreversible, but reversible. It means that if something will go wrong, we can change it because it is under our Israeli control. You're talking about Rabin's vision, what Rabin, what Rabin intended. Yes, and actually it is really confirmed to be wrong because everyone learning what happened in Gaza, it is irreversible. At the moment, the Israeli troops crossing the border, it is Kazu's belly, it is a war with missiles and rockets to Tel Aviv. So they have a leverage to a kind of mutual deterrence between Israeli forces and Hamas and Jihad in Gaza. The same happened here in Jenin and Nablus because actually what we are finding in the modus operandi of IDF is not that we are coming back to occupy and clean the old cells of terror. We are coming for a night as a strike, killing someone, taking someone, and going out. It means that the basic control of the terrorist groups is still present there. What else we must emphasize? Due to that trouble, that part of them are the direct outcome of lack of Jewish settlements. Because why there is a difference between the circumstances in Hebron, Bethlehem, and the circumstances in Nablus 
in Jenin, because in Hebron there is Jewish presence inside the city, and there are a lot of Jewish settlements there that creating different situation regarding the, the security situation. The fact that we uprooted the settlements from Jenin uh, territory, every entrance of IDF forces to Jenin city is a, a march of uh, trucks and uh, APCs. They have time to prepare themselves. In Hebron, you can just jump from the Jewish house to the other house. So they have not time to prepare. Here they are way, well protected due to the fact that there are no Jewish presence and Israelis civilians present in this territory. Therefore, they are more protected as uh, the terrorists. So what is really required? This is a situation in which it is really necessary to rebuild Chomesh, for example. And who are against that? The Israelis. Comish is one of the. the Comish is one of the. Due wait, to wait, American wait. pressure. Wait. And right, why? Just, they, to up, just to back up for one second, Chomish is one of the four Jewish communities that was uprooted yes. in northern Samaria around Janine, and surrounding. It's located Janine, in a very high position. High position. Right. high position in the way to Janine. Very, very strategic okay. position. And why the Americans and the Israeli security leaders, due to the American uh, pressure against rebuilding that settlement, because it is an exemplification of irreversibility. If already the Israelis withdraw from that position, no way to come back. It means that this is disconfirmation to the basic premise of Rabin that the whole process is reversible. They are trying the Palestinians, in, together with European and American, making pressure against Israeli government, not to let the Israelis to transform the bad circumstances back to what, had, what was the situation before the withdrawal. So this is a second premise that coming to be wrong, the reversibility, it is irreversible. The third is that after Israeli withdrawal, after accomplishing main parts of Oslo agreement, we are getting international legitimation for our ne uh, security necessities. Then every day night or every night that we are acting in Jenin, it is due to requirements to protect civ Israeli civilians. If we are criticized by doing that repeated actions again and again in the depths of Palestinian cities, it means that actually it is a dream to think that all that withdrawals are delivering Israel international legitimation. Not at all. They are asking what on earth you, you are finding in these repeated actions inside the cities. Don't do that because they are trying to explain that this action in themselves are what escalating the situation, exactly the opposite. Without these operations that are absolutely for defense uh, purposes, we would suffer terrorist attacks in Tel Aviv, Netanya, in all Israeli cities. So the third prim and premise also collapsed. We are not really getting international support. Just for example, what happened after the killing situation of uh, Al Jazeera journalist. A lot of journalists are killed in battlefields. Even you could be killed in uh, uh, your time you uh, participated in the op American operation in Iraq. But what's the difference that they are asking what on earth you are doing there? I mean, the very fact that we are coming to act in that arena, it is an Israeli fault. It means not at all is international legitimation. The false premise is that 
a Palestinian entity. Doesn't matter whether it will be a state or as Yitzhak Rabin def defines that as an entity less than a state, must be and would be forever demilitarized. What we are facing in Gaza, what we are facing in Jenin, that they are absolutely equipped. The vision of demilitarization is empty. And from where they are getting all these new weapons for Jenin, they are smuggled from Jordan, part of them by Iranian forces through Jordan. We are knowing what we are succeeding to stop. Not all the other smugglers are succeeding to bring the weapons. So the very demand of the Israelis that Palestinian authority, Palestinian state or entity will be demilitarized is absolutely empty concept. Today, no zone in the world could be really demilitarized. The fifth uh, premise is that economical prosperity will prepare new conditions that prevent the motivation for terror. Actually, Jenin is a prosperous city. All Israeli Arabs from the Galil every uh, weekend coming to Jenin uh, to buy them, everything. Even I was offered by friends, Jews or others, to send my car to replace my engine there. <laughs> it is really interest interesting to emphasize, if we are speaking about apartheid, in the entrance to Jenin it is written, uh, the entrance is prohibited for Israelis, but actually the interpretation is it is prohibited to Jewish Israelis, not to Arab Israelis. Therefore, Jenin became a very prosperous city, including the Hem, American University with medical studies. And Israeli Arabs are studying there. So it is one of the richest cities in the whole Middle East. So they are so rich, what about the promise that if they will celebrate prosperity, they will just uh, forget about terror motivation. Not at all, exactly the opposite. The sixth one is, the sixth premise is about the partnership with the Palestinian Authority, whether it is Arafat or the follower Abu Mazen. Actually, Abu Mazen supporting the terroristic. He's paying for them, paying for their families. He's not at all uh, speaking against all these new organizations, even though he lost control upon them. So who is really the partner? The idea that we must uh, find Abu, Abu Mazen as a hope for new situation, new hope for two-state solution is absolutely not at all beginning to be true according to his behavior. So all these six premises are collapsing. And if we are just now getting a visit of new American uh, person trying to convince us that there is a hope in all this stupid idea of two states between the Jordan and the sea, they are just against the Israeli existence. They can never really convince us that they are really, as they are declaring again and again, committed to the security of Israel. Building and establishing a state, Palestinian state, in that arena between the Jordan and what was called the Green Border is a severe danger to Israel, much more severe than the nuclear threat from Iran. Okay, so you gave all of the premises that have just uh, fallen apart that the uh, Oslo process was based upon. Um, and uh, people, if they wanna see a summation of it, can also look in my, in my book, The Israeli Solution, A One-State Plan for Peace in the Middle East from 2014. But um, so 
first of all, you raised something here that I just want to um, spend a little bit of time, if you can explain. You said that Israel's military leadership, whether it's uh, Defense Minister Gantz or former Chief of Staff Eisenkot, who's now joined him in his uh, political party, and so many others of your former colleagues in the general staff, that they're influenced by the Pentagon in their refusal to uh, in their refusal to walk away from all of the failed premises of the Oslo process and their continued insistence on separation as a concept that has any rationality at all uh, for Israel on a, on a national or, or a military level. Uh, can you explain a little bit about the, uh, about the relationship uh, that, you, that you've witnessed between uh, Israel's military leadership and the Pentagon just to explain it a little bit better? First of all, the Israeli... Uh... All, uh, it is not only IDF, it is all uh, security forces are too much influenced by Americans' uh, influence, by American cultural uh, inspiration, and by uh, too close personal connections to Americans. They are not really independent Jews uh, working for the benefit and future of the Jewish people. Secondly, uh, speaking uh, from a professional point of view, I think that we must explain that phenomena. It is a real riddle how so many military experts are not seeing the whole uh, picture like they are just touching every tree in the forest and yet not conceiving the whole forest. And they are coming to that because they are suffering from too much excellency in micro-tactical operations, exactly like a, a brain surgery, micro that forgot everything about uh, ordinary medicine. It is the last one that I will take for a delegation uh, uh, to the a jungle or something like that, because I need someone in direct connection to daily ordinary health problems and not just specific uh, excellent uh, uh, operations. And they are there, they are suffering from excellency. And beyond that, what they are not understanding, the whole macro, Situations. The global arena is absolutely different from those days of Oslo. In that time that Yitzhak Rabin decided to open the window for the ideas of Oslo, the whole global atmosphere was with the speaking of Okayama, we are facing the end of history, a global peace. Today, exactly the opposite wars everywhere, including the war in Ukraine. And part of what's going on in Jenin is inspiration from what's going on in Ukraine. If the Ukrainian can face the Russians, why not they can face and engage with IDF forces successfully? Therefore, we are in a different global reality. And they are not at all aware about the whole implications of this new global reality. War is really coming back to everywhere, even to Western Europe. So they didn't understand, they, so they don't understand either the geo geopolitical situation where, you know, in 1993, the United States had just won this, the Cold War, it was the unipower, it was the only one around. Exactly. And today, it's being, uh, it's being, uh, it's in competition now, not only with with a rising China and with a research in Russia, but uh, from all quarters and uh, Even exclusive, just, both uh, in Afghanistan, in Iran. What if, for example, the Iranian Navy are daring to engage and right. to challenge the American Navy in the, the Arab Sea? Right. These are things that we've never seen and also attack U.S. forces in Syria fairly regularly. But um, so the United States is a much weaker position. There are global powers that are, are much stronger than anybody imagined they would ever become. 
1993 and so on and so forth. But this really brings us um, uh, back to the Biden administration and under uh, and a weakened America, uh, apparently not aware of its weakness, but still uh, completely intent on pushing this to state solution. And, and that, that so clearly fundamentally uh, and resoundingly failed in, in, in every direction uh, for the past uh, 30 years. Um, and how do you, or do you have an explanation for, for, this, for this obsession? You think that it's, it's just animus towards Israel that's, fun, that's, uh, that's um, that it's at the root of this? I don't think it is just against Israel. It is a kind of obstacle, mental obstacle to understand the a definite change in the phenomena of warfare. Even the fact that the Russians are not succeeding, it's not only so simple to say that they are just nothing. They are failing due to the fact that with new weapons, uh, units that are unprepared, equipped with the appropriate weapon could really be effective in the new battlefield. It is due to the um, RPV everywhere, due to a lot of uh, um, capabilities, including making a, a connection between a very, very simple devices, like Rachfanim, uh, how to call them? Uh, like gliders. That you can buy them everywhere in eBay and to connect them to, our, to simple artillery. It is a definite change in the warfare. So it means that if in uh, the Gulf, the first Gulf War, uh, in uh, 1991, the American superiority was absolutely clear. Today, they lost their superiority and they are aware about that because they lost the, te the technological superiority because today everyone could, can be equipped with new technological devices. They are just on the shelves everywhere, very cheap. But you know, but you know Israel's uh, claim to fame and you hear it very clearly from, from the mouths of the same generals that are insisting that separation is, is a doable uh, uh, is a doable concept uh, with the Palestinians in Judea and Samaria. Um, all they keep talking about is Israel's technological prowess, Israel's technological advantage. This is, uh, so no, how do you explain that? This is, is an the, an idea hand, the proliferation, But no, on the other hand, the proliferation of these of these technologies is fantastic. so deep. This idea belonged to the last century. We are in the 21st century. Everyone equipped with the best uh, computer, with the best cellular phone, uh, even if he's uh, an alphabetic. Even if he's a literate. Yes, and uh, just we can find the Houthi in Yemen, what they are doing with uh, launching uh, excellent uh, new weapons like uh, rackets, etc. Precise ammunition. They can do that in the same way that I can build IKEA furniture. I'm getting it, getting instructions, and building it. So the technology you think is actually is actually far less important than, or being able to develop cutting edge technology is actually not the strategic advantage that that Israel has. Exactly. military. And it is also is part it. part of premises that a. Uh, dropped with Rabin to take uh, this risk in, in, in his decision-making uh, uh, risk management, he took that uh, basic premise as for, for granted that we will keep this, a technological superiority. So the other question then uh, arising from, from, I mean, you gave sort of the, the background overview of the situation and why it is so uh, volatile in Samaria today, I would argue that it's also volatile in Judea and Samaria. We just had uh, outside of Hebron on uh, Friday, 
on yes. an attempted uh, or an actual attack. But it was uh, with a knife. It was carried out. What? Pay attention. It was an attack against a soldier with a knife, not with a rifle. And it was carried out, and it was carried out by a member of the Palestinian security forces. So it isn't just that it was carried out by, against a, a soldier with a knife. It was carried out by his ostensible colleague, the, the Palestinian security forces that are supposed to right. be operating it means uh, that in, in cooperation with, with, with the IDF. It means that the whole idea of Dayton Force that will be loyal to the new story of a two-state solution is really an idea that couldn't be a, an like how to say, an everlasting promise. Nothing is everlasting. Every day, a new, a new day, new motivation. So, George, so, so, so Gershon, let's just go for a second from the wider, you know, sort of meta understanding of why things are so bad in Judea and Samaria to actually the situation on the ground throughout, because what we've seen over the past year, year and a half with uh, Benny Gantz, the defense minister, having total control over the areas and Israeli policy in the areas is that he's transferred a, an enormous amount of control over areas in area C. Area A, we said, was the Palestinian uh, urban centers or cities, area B being their, their large villages, and area C, which was under complete Israeli civil and, and, uh, and security control, are where all of the Israeli communities are, is where all of the Israeli the military bases are. All the main border. positions. All of the roads, all of the border areas, uh, all of the uh, all of the passages uh, to Israel's major urban centers, everything that has any military or national value, for that matter, for for Israel, is in Area C. And what we've seen over the past year or so is that Benny Gantz has done something that's been unprecedented: the scope of his permission that he's been giving to the Palestinians to expand massively their hold on lands in Area C. Uh, has been really remarkable. We see where I live in Efrat and in the whole Gush Etzion area. Because they uh, are ignoring. The, the, all, of course. So, so all of the all of the areas that are surrounding all of our communities that make it this blossoming uh, block of communities in in uh, in Judea, in Judea uh, are being taken over by Palestinian agriculture, Palestinian illegal mines and quarries. Um, so can you speak a little bit to what the concept guiding Gantz is, how the Americans are involved in it, and what the implications are for what's been happening under his uh, rule, essentially, his uncontested control of the area as defense minister, uh, what the implications are for, for Israeli security? Actually, Benny Gantz, uh, together with the Americans, are working subversively against the public opinion of the Jews in Israel. Actually, they realized that time is not prepared for a new ceremony in the White House, the declaration of new peace. So what exactly they are doing on earth, instead of what happened in White Plantation, a huge debate about transforming 10% from being Israeli territory to Palestinian territory. This was the White Plantation uh, negotiations that were carried out in 1998. So what they are doing now, they are making a de facto transformation and not the Euro. It means the zone is still zone C, but de facto it is transformed to be in all considerations zone B because Palestinians are coming to live there and no Israeli control there anymore from that moment. And why they are doing that? Basically, Benny Gantz ignoring the necessity of settlements in the cooperation between the civilian life and the IDF effort in the arena. Why the Americans lost in Afghanistan? Because the soldiers themselves are the wicked point in the whole equitation. Those who are living in the territory by exemplifying that they are here in order to stay, it means settlers are part of bringing the equilibrium 
of stability because why is the uh, terrorist activity is going to act because he has hope. And what is the hope? That we are not behaving in a way that we are in making manifestations that we are here in order to stay. The army is never in order to stay. The army is a wicked point in the whole equitation. Therefore, they are not really letting a building of, of giving a, the whole uh, permission to build, we must build every new village or every new house in the Jewish settlement is a kind of statement that they are not really keeping a hope for bringing effectiveness for their terrorist activity because we are here in order to stay. It means that Benny Gantz is against his fathers from the Mapai party of Ben Gurion that always uh, insisted to keep the connection between settlers and military activity. So, okay, but I, I, I think you're right. I mean, I know you're right, but, but uh, just to give it a little bit more detail, I mean, right now, um, first of all, the first question that arises is, is this reversible? I mean, everywhere we look uh, in Efrat, uh, the entrances are the are, are the entrances to our our town are being turned into uh, gauntlets hey, through I, illegal Palestinian buildings. Um, the access roads that are going to block the it from the, from the our access road from expanding to enable our city to to uh, grow, um, and all all of the agricultural areas around our town are being cultivated now. Uh, by the Palestinians through the largesse of the uh, defense uh, defense minister. And this is going on throughout Judea and Samaria. There was just a recent uh, uh, a recent uh, report that came out with the odd con oh, yeah. uh, organization that they have some, you know, I don't remember if it's hundreds of illegal quarries that they've built uh, throughout Judea and Samaria that are decimating the environment. Um, and all of this, the Israeli government and Gans are turning a blind eye and enabling uh, oh, I wild. understand. Actually, what was built is irreversible. In the in August 2001, one month before 9/11, I participated in the Pentagon in a conference about revolution in military affairs, and everyone spoke there about uh, uh, special forces, uh, leadership, uh, special. Uh, uh, forces, uh, expeditionary forces to the space, etc. And I told them that building a house is a new strategic weapon. And I described them how Arafat encouraging the Palestinians to bypass Jerusalem, to build from Bethlehem, uh, the Atra, Azaria, and to close Jerusalem to develop to the east side. And this is a strategic threat. And uh, an American force uh, general was Air Force was sitting there and said, "What's the problem? You have F-16, F-15. You can bomb them." I told them, "How? Um, of course not. We cannot bomb them. They are civilians, uh, fa factors of strategical warfare. And actually, at the moment they are there. It is irreversible. But yet, it is not absolutely." late. We can lead an Israeli uh, effort to build and to capture those necessary hills, necessary roads, and to build actively. It means that in the situation right now, the Palestinians are absolutely active and the Israelis are passive. And they are uh, passive according to the instructions of the Americans and Benny Gantz is uh, working with them together, understanding uh, eye by eye what they are expecting him to do. So a revolution in the Israeli policy must take place. Well, that of course is subject to elections um, because under the current government, I don't think there's any chance that that's happening. And, and you know, I, I, it's not directly related to the military issue, but I think one of the things that's so stunning to me is that, you know, um, since, uh, 
at least, you know, at the latest 2000, and when you're talking about August of 2001, we had already been suffering from a concerted terrorist war that, uh, that, that Arafat launched in September of 2000. August, we had uh, so many suicide bombings, perhaps the largest and most uh, notorious was the Sparrow uh, Pizzeria bombing in Jerusalem, where you had, I think, uh, 15 or 16 people killed and eight of whom were children with their parents uh, on the last week of uh, summer vacation. And the Americans uh, seemed to be unaware of the implications for, for, for them or for Israel of what had been created uh, by the Oslo process. And here we are all these years later, and so many Israelis have been killed, and yet the Israeli left and the security brass uh, refuses to look at the reality in the face and recognize that, that, that this just is an unsustainable thing. So really the irreversible, the most irreversible aspect of Oslo was what it did to the Israeli left. Um, and, I, and I find it just so, so disheartening uh, that this is the case. I mean, we're faced with a situation where only one half of Israeli society is willing to base policies on reality and they are only to a limited degree. Of course, and therefore I'm getting anxiety whenever I'm listening to a new American president promising we are committed to the security of Israel. Actually, they are meaning security for Tel Aviv, security for uh, those cities closing to Tel Aviv. I'm calling them Gush Dan Ghetto. They are committing to the security of the Jewish ghetto along the sea. But so the, if just security is the whole purpose, why not in California? Uh, but we are here not only in order to get secured life, much more than that. We need homeland, and the homeland is not Tel Aviv in itself. It, the Tel Aviv function is to be a gate to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is not a Chavia in West Jerusalem. It is a Mount of Temple. This is a story. I remember I spoke with that with General Zini in 2001. And then he asked me, do you mean that the whole issue is a religious one? I told him, absolutely yes. And if not, there is not at all a problem. And if you are not understanding the Mount of Temple problem, so you can remove the Mount of Temple problem, a, a location from East Jerusalem to West Jerusalem, why not to remove it already to California? But it is a location, specific location, and it is a religious conflict to begin with. You know, Gershon, I think what you're saying is so key. And I want to just thank you so much for your insight. As Barbara Liff, I think she's a former uh, member of Peace Now, and she was brought on to be in charge of the Middle East uh, in the State Department. Uh, she's coming here, or is it the National Security Council? I can't even remember anymore. Uh, but. Uh, she uh, is coming here now, and her plan is to uh, escalate U.S. and Israeli actions to resuscitate a policy that has caused only death and devastation and has endangered, really, Israel's very existence uh, for the past 23 years. So I appreciate, so how many years? Uh, 1993 to 30, 30 years. Uh, so I appreciate so much your your time and and uh, really the detail that you've brought to the discussion and your security expertise in, in relating to it. I'm going to have to have you on this show much more often to talk about things. So thank you, thank you very much for joining me uh, today. Thank you. We are all, all right. wishing to the best uh, future for all the people in that land, of course, for the Jewish people, but for all of them. I couldn't agree more, and, and especially as we're coming up on Rosh Hashanah, and uh, and we really have to begin and every and end every every uh, conversation with uh, greetings of Shana Tova and uh, Happy New Year, and, and may the year coming upon us be be a good year and a better year than the last one. And here, I just wanted to uh, share with you guys uh, some closing thoughts after listening to uh, Gershon General Gershon Akoy, um and and what he explained to us just now. Um, you know. What we're seeing more and more today is this loss of faith on the part of uh, Westerners and particularly Western elites uh, in, their, in their people, in their nations, in their understanding of why they're part of a collective, 
Uh, we see this very clearly in the United States, of course, where you have the elites in America um, are going after all of the national symbols and proclaiming them to be somehow systemically racist and evil. And so you have purgings of art museums. You have obviously the uh, the dictatorships of the of the woke academia uh, that's blocking uh, uh, free uh, access to ideas and discussion of ideas at America's top universities. Um, and and through all of this, the legitimization of anti-Semitism, hatred of Israel, and the transformation of the war against Israel to something that's only perhaps second to the war against America, and certainly more openly discussed in, in uh, polite company. And in Israel, you have a similar, um, a similar distancing and even uh, cutting off of our elite class from the nation of Israel from the animating concepts of Judaism. Just last week, uh, the uh, education minister, Shasha Biton, announced that they were ending all study of Jewish history before the 19th century in Israeli schools, that ch children aren't going to learn about uh, Judah Maccabee any longer in schools or about the Bar Kokhba revolt. Uh, and that as far as the Ministry of Education under the woke left is concerned, uh, Jewish history begins in the 19th century, uh, from which you can understand nothing about what it means to be Jewish or what it means that Israel exists. They also cut off all, all, all trips to, to Auschwitz, to Poland, to visit uh, the Holocaust uh, sites so that uh, Holocaust education in Israel is being whittled down to, to nothingness as a result. Um, so we're seeing this uh, cultivation of ignorance of what it means to be a nation, in Israel's case, what it means to be a Jew, what it means to have a homeland in the land of Israel uh, by our elites. And at the same time, we're seeing strategic actions being taken by our nation's leadership, our woke national leadership, uh, that make it increasingly difficult as a practical matter for Israel to defend itself in any meaningful way uh, from the Palestinians. And as we see with the uh, nuclear deal, which I discussed last week with Richard Goldberg, also from Iran and its nuclear threat to Israel. It's as if nothing matters anymore. If our nationhood doesn't matter, then similarly, we're not supposed to take seriously threats from our enemies, whether they're Palestinian or Iranians, calling for the annihilation of our country, because it's really all about us and our inherent evil and finality. And so this concept, this decolonization ideology, this anti-Western ideology, this anti-Semitic ideology, this anti-historical ideology, uh, ideology is it, its goal is to essentially annihilate our nations when we can understand it or not is really the question that defines our time whether we can defend ourselves against our own people against our own elites is really the question that's going to define our times uh gershon cohen who we spoke with today has really been a lone voice in the IDF for many, many years, trying to explain the importance, not only of Jewish settlement in the land of Israel, along the lines that were really understood by Ben Gurion and the, uh, the Zionist socialists who, who formed the country, who established the country, who led the country until 1977, uh, to, to a military leadership, to a national security uh, elite in Israel that simply doesn't wanna hear anything that sees only not only do they only they only see the trees and not the forest, they oftentimes see only individual leaves of the trees. They don't even see the branches of the trees. Because from every every corner, the truth is shouting out to them that Israeli withdrawals from Judea and Samaria, like the ones from Gaza, have been devastating to Israel's national security. But they're so intent on fighting their political enemies on the right, and that includes and involves attacking Jewish history, attacking our, our national heritage, which is really the cradle of that heritage is Judea and Samaria and Jerusalem, that they don't wanna hear anything. They don't wanna look at anything. And, and uh, the nightly raids in Janine that are so limited, that are so you know, tiny in scope versus the expansion of the threat emanating from Janine and Northern Samaria um, show just how impossible it is for our elites to take anything seriously. You saw that in the United States in the raid in Mar-a-Lago, which led directly to Biden's effective declaration of war against um, half of the United States population last Thursday. So I think you have to watch this space. You have to see what happens in Israel. You have to understand also the elections that are taking place, the fifth now in three years. 
um, as very much a definitive moment in Israeli history. After a year of this woke government, um, I think Israelis should already understand the stakes. And yet we see all of the time the media seeking to uh, raise up everything to a, a shallow level so that we don't see the forest from the trees, so that we don't even see the trees themselves and what's at stake. This is happening in Israel. It's obviously happening in the United States. And we just have to wish and hope and work towards uh, our people recognizing the stakes and, and acting to protect our national identity, our national sense of purpose, and our territory. Um, so I thank you very much for watching. And next week, we're going to have another episode of this show where we'll talk about something else with somebody else. And uh, I hope you stay tuned to this space, whether it's through uh, the podcast or, or watching. Take care and have a great week. Thank you.